Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. You have joined the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute's Public Health for All Y'all Virtual Policy Forum. My name is Erin Robinson, and I am the Director of Outreach and Strategic Campaigns here at GBPI. Today, I'll serve as your moderator. We believe that a thriving, fully funded state and local public health system can help us build toward a more just and equitable Georgia. Our hope is that you leave this hour together feeling informed and inspired to take action. As a collective, we have the power to shape and advocate for a people-powered public health budget that builds healthier communities and brighter futures for all Georgians. We recognize that some who were interested in attending today's webinar were not able to as they were away from work to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. We send our well wishes to them and look forward to sharing the recording. We also want to acknowledge the recent events that may be foremost on people's minds, from the devastating impacts of Hurricane Helene on our neighbors and the chemical fire impacting those in Metro Atlanta. And we are reminded of the role a strong public health system plays in responding to events such as these that impact health and well being. For our main event today, you will be hearing from national expert Dr. Anand Parekh. However, First, we want to hear from you all and call upon your expertise and lived experience. We'd like to collectively reflect on the following questions. What does public health mean to you? And how would you explain its value to a stranger? My colleague, Hillary, will be, will be bringing up Mentimeter on the screen. For those of you unfamiliar, to share your response anonymously, you have two options. You can go to menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com, on your cell phone, tablet, or your laptop, and enter the following code, 7243-3234. And I'll repeat that code again, or you can also see it on your screen, 7243-3234. You could also use your cell phone to scan the QR code on the screen. Once you've entered this code, it will take you to a, a second screen where you can type your response. I'll give folks a couple of minutes to enter their responses. Great, happy to see some responses coming in. Hillary, did you wanna take us to the next page? Great. And if you have any questions about how to use the Mentimeter or how to enter your answer, please feel free to put the, your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. All right, great, seeing some answers. Public health means protecting and promoting the health, the health of all people in all communities. Taking a more holistic approach to understanding and addressing health needs in a community. Looking at the collective rather than the individual. Seeing some great answers coming in. A doctor helps keep individuals healthy. Public health makes sure everyone is healthy. Great, great, awesome. Supporting healthy communities and lifestyles protecting your health and well-being by making it safer where you live, work, and play, preventing illnesses versus treating rather than treating illnesses. We've got some great answers coming in. Community-centered health providers and, of course, another focus on preventing diseases in the collective. Great. Awesome. We've got some great responses here. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing about what public health means to you. How would you how you would explain its value to a stranger? Hillary, do we have any more answers we want to share? Okay, I see community oriented health care. Awesome. We'll let people enter their final answers and then we'll move on to the next portion.
Wonderful. So we really appreciate you all sharing what public health means to you. And with that, I'll pass it over to GBPI's Director of Health Justice, Leah Chan, to share more about the impetus for today's event and to introduce our keynote speaker. Leah? Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. So as many of you know, cross-sector partners from education to business to the faith-based community all play a role in public health. However, government often serves as the backbone. So here in Georgia, the state and local public health system are the boots on the ground working to prevent disease, injury, and disability, promote health and well-being, and prepare for and respond to disasters. So Georgia's state and local public health system operates a shared government structure with one Department of Public Health, 159 county health departments, each with its own Board of Health, and those 159 county health departments are organized into 18 public health districts. And ultimately, all of Georgia's almost one, uh, excuse me, almost all of Georgia's 11 million residents benefit from the services and functions provided by our state and local public health system. From the environmental health workers um, who inspect our restaurants, to the nurses who immunize children against preventable diseases, to the home visitors who provide support to new mothers and their babies, to the epidemiologists who investigate disease outbreaks and track drug overdose deaths, our dedicated public health workforce is often invisible but always relevant, working to create the conditions where all Georgians can thrive, no matter where they live, how many dollars they have in their pocket, or what they look like. So Georgia's public health system is truly a public good. Next slide. So data tell us that medical care is estimated to account for only about 10 to 20 percent of the modifiable contributors to healthy outcomes for a population. The other 80 to 90% are health-related behaviors, socioeconomic factors, and environmental factors. And some of these are the factors the public health plays such an important role in addressing. In the words of one former Surgeon General, healthcare is vital to all of us some of the time, but public health is vital to all of us all of the time. And yet our state's health investment focuses primarily downstream on catching folks when they're already sick or in crisis. Although general fund appropriations for the Department of Public Health have doubled since it became a standalone agency in 2011, the funding has never surpassed the $500 million mark. Proportionally, if the state had $10 to spend on its three primary health agencies in fiscal year 2025, Seven of those dollars would go towards Department of Community Health, which runs our Medicaid program. Two of those dollars would go to Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And less than one of those dollars would go toward Department of Public Health. So we have an exciting opportunity to invest additional dollars upstream into prevention and keeping people well that could ultimately yield a higher return for our state's bottom line. Next slide. So we also see that our investment in public health has not kept pace with inflation, nor with the scale of the public health issues we face. Preventable but urgent issues like rising rates of suicide, maternal mortality, new HIV infections, and more. So as illustrated by the graph below, state general fund appropriations for public health have increased from about $18 per person in fiscal year 2012 to about 33 in fiscal year 2024. The biggest year-to-year -year jump occurred in fiscal year 2023 and is primarily accounted for by some much needed salary increases for some job categories, as well as the $5,000 cost of living increases for all full-time staff. Despite this modest increase in state appropriations, combined state and federal appropriations have actually decreased since fiscal year 2012, from about $92 per person to about $70 per person. So with strategic investment, we can really build on the strengths of our state and local public health system and ensure we have the infrastructure and foundation needed to respond to the health threats of tomorrow while creating the conditions in which people can thrive today. So what I shared about our state and local public health system really barely skims the surface. 
So later this fall, we'll be releasing a report that goes in depth on the structure and funding of our state and local public health departments, highlights potential barriers as well as opportunities, and offers evidence for how a fully funded public health system could support a more equitable and just Georgia. However, to kick off these conversations and to orient us towards larger trends around strengthening and investing in public health, we have invited a renowned national expert to speak to us today. Dr. Anand Parekh is the Chief Medical Officer of the Bipartisan Policy Center, a not-for-profit organization that ensures policymakers work across party lines to craft bipartisan solutions. In his role as Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Parikh provides clinical and public health expertise across the organization and has led specific efforts tackling a variety of policy issues, including the COVID-19 pandemic, the future of public health, and the importance of business and public health collaboration. Prior to his current role, he spent over a decade in leadership roles at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He is a board-certified internal medicine physician and a native of Michigan. His accolades and his accomplishments are many, and we are so humbled to have him here today to share his insights. So Dr. Parekh, I will turn it over to you. Leah, thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction. It's great to be with you. Uh, thank you for that presentation as well. I, I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but it was uh, very, very informative. Uh, and I wanna thank the audience who's tuned in as well. Thank you for your leadership, your advocacy, I can tell from the Mentimeter that, that, that you all already know about the importance of, of, of public health. Uh, special thanks also to the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute uh, for the Institute's leadership. Uh, as Leah said, um, I work in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the Bipartisan Policy Center. We are a nonprofit think tank that tries to take the best ideas from both sides to promote health security and opportunity, and certainly public health uh, is one of the areas over the last few years uh, that we have been focused on. And, and I would say that, that um, at the outset, my, my central message to all of you uh, is that though you know about the importance of public health, we need to really take back how we define public health in this country. For too many Americans, what they think about public health uh, has understandably been clouded by their experiences during COVID. Uh, but as all of you know, public health is, uh, what public health does is ensuring that for example, the, the air and water um, that we breathe and we drink are clean, that our roads are safe, that our schools and businesses and restaurants are hygienic, that harmful substances don't come into our communities, that infectious diseases are kept at bay, uh, that physical activity and nutrition um, uh, opportunities are there. I mean, that's what public health is doing every single day. We take it for granted. We don't talk about it as much, but it's saving lives every day. And we really need to help others and the public understand that public health is just like other parts of our nation's infrastructure, whether it's transportation and roads and bridges and tunnels or the electrical grid or telecommunications. Uh, it's part of the fabric uh, of, of our society, it allows us to reach our potential uh, and really to, to thrive with the freedoms that we have. It's really talking about kitchen table issues. And I think redefining public health uh, for our colleagues, for policymakers, for our neighbors is really, really important uh, moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. I want to start by just providing a little bit of, of background from my uh, perspective. And, and this, speak, this slide speaks to this idea that, that we can actually do better. And, and it focuses on the five leading causes of death in the United States. Uh, and the idea is that if, if those states that have the highest death rates could do as well as those states that have the lowest death rates, then for these five leading causes of death, much of which are preventable, that we could save annually 200, um, 250,000 um, lives. Next slide, please. This slide speaks to really the urgency uh, in another way, the idea that we've had stagnant life expectancy in this country uh, for over a decade now. In fact, prior to the pandemic, between 2014 and 2016, we had experienced our first three-year decline in life expectancy in 100 years since the 1918 great pa pandemic. What's been driving uh, the stagnant U.S. life expectancy? Well, it's, it's a myriad preventable factors. Uh, the opioid epidemic, diseases of despair, the obesity crisis, the plateauing and the decline of deaths from cardiovascular disease, 
certainly COVID. Uh, we've seen tremendous disparities uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, it gives you an idea of if we invested in, in public health and prevention more, we can really turn these trends around. Next slide, please. And this is another slide just related to, to the pandemic that we're coming out of. And it points to the fact that if you look at why people were hospitalized during the pandemic, two thirds of hospitalizations are attributable to four major preventable cardiometabolic conditions, obesity, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, heart failure. So much of this can be prevented again through uh, population-based public health measures or clinical preventive services. Next slide, please. This slide shows also whether you look globally uh, when we compare the US with OECD countries or wh whether you look at, at the 50 states here and you see Georgia uh, right at the line in, in the middle curve here, that when you spend more on social services compared to healthcare services, when that ratio of spend is higher, you have better health outcomes. And I think from a public health perspective, public health understands us the importance of looking at those broader drivers and determinants of health and ensuring that, that those social services are tended to, to maximize health outcomes in this country. Next slide, please. And this final background slide uh, reminds us that of the four and a half trillion dollars spent on health in the United States, only about 5% goes to clinical preventive services, only about three to 4% goes to traditional public health and only six to 7% go to primary care. I call this the four Ps because at the end of the day, if we really want to improve population health, then we really have to focus on prevention, public health, and primary care. And these three percentages, by the way, are, are not mutually exclusive. So there's a lot of overlap here. And so ultimately, where we spend our resources, that defines our priorities. And our priorities essentially reflect our values. And so the question for all of us and our colleagues and policymakers is ultimately, how healthy of a nation do we wanna be? Next slide, please. And so what I wanna spend just a couple of minutes talking to you about today is an initiative that the Bipartisan Policy Center led at the behest of national public health associations and philanthropies. Uh, we started this several years ago, it's called Public Health Forward, to articulate a five-year vision for public health, for governmental public health in particular in the US and an actionable framework for state and local elected and health officials to reach this vision. We started this work uh, at the end of 2021. Uh, at that time, there had been, as you know, a significant short-term infusion of COVID dollars to states and localities to prop up public health. It also came at a challenging point that we're still at that point, uh, really for governmental public health, given the politicization uh, of the pandemic. Next slide, please. And we did what we do here at the Bipartisan uh, Policy Center, where we convene experts and thought leaders uh, really from both sides, and we had an array of elected officials at the local and state level, both Democratic as well as Republicans. On our task force, we had representation from faith-based organizations, the business community, uh, the healthcare institutions. We had a separate public health advisory group uh, that provided support uh, to this task force, but really many, many different sectors represented on this task force. Next slide, please. And essentially, after nine months of deliberations, the, the task force came up with this vision that in five years, the U.S. is becoming a healthier nation because elected and public health officials working together sees the historic opportunity to invest in new and transformative ways to modernize the governmental public health system. In a healthier America, there'd be a focus on ensuring that all Americans have that opportunity to reach their highest health potential, their sufficient, predictable, and flexible public health funding, interoperable and secure public health information systems, modernized laws, and a highly skilled and trained diverse public health workforce. Next slide, please. And this is essentially the, fr the framework uh, with the, the centerpiece being here, advancing health equity uh, through a five-year plan. And, they, and these are the six pillars of, of the framework. And ultimately what the task force did is identify in each of these six domains, um, key action steps for both elected officials as well as public health officials, uh, and then sub actions for elected officials and public health uh, officials. And I just wanna take a couple of minutes to run through uh, each of these six pillars and, and go over the overarching uh, action steps. Next slide, please. 
So I think for many of us, it starts with financing. And Leah has already provided some national numbers as well as Georgia State numbers. Uh, but th there was a real focus on ensuring that localities and states have flexible funding. And uh, so they're really able to maximize assets to support public health, as well as then all, uh, also to evaluate the social and economic impact of public health programs. So we can tell the story of the importance of these funds, what these funds did, not only from a health perspective, but from an economic perspective as well. Over the last several years, the, the literature has, has improved such that we can now uh, delineate how much additional resources do we need in public health to assure the conditions and populations can be healthy. Uh, at a national level, it's about $34 uh, per capita. It's about $10 billion overall uh, annually, again, to assure the conditions and populations can be help, uh, healthy. Uh, that public health services are provided, that foundational capabilities are there in all health departments to serve uh, all, all Americans. Some states, such as Ohio, uh, over the last few years, they've really taken a lead and, and costed out uh, what would it take to assure uh, and, and to ensure uh, that public health services, foundational public health services are provided to all of its citizens, uh, and then try to look at, well, how much do they currently spend? What's the gap? Other states have gone beyond Ohio, for example, the state of Indiana, which several years ago, the governor uh, commissioned a bipartisan uh, group of leaders to really study the public health system in Indiana, understand what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what are we spending our resources on? Uh, the recommendations from that commission uh, actually led the state legislature in Indiana to increase funding for public health by $225 million over two years, dollars going to localities. Um, first time they had done that. And, and really, it was a confluence of factors. They had a budget surplus, but they really understood the importance of communicating the merits of public health beyond what people have just experienced during COVID. They had multi-sectoral support as well from the business community and, and others. So, so this, has, this is being done in, in ways in blue states and red states and purple states. Wisconsin has a public health forward initiative uh, as well. So this is certainly something uh, um, that can happen in Georgia and, and other states as well. Next slide, please. The second pillar uh, of public health forward focused on data and information technology, both the bi-directional flow of public health data from local, state, and federal public health, as well as that then exchange between public health and, and healthcare, just like we're seeing right now with electronic case, uh, case reporting. So data and information technology really shoring up um, um, the public health data infrastructure, also a critical area of focus uh, for the task force. Next slide, please. When it comes to workforce, we've seen a 50% reduction in the public health, governmental public health workforce since the start of the pandemic. And the best research indicates from the De Beaumont Foundation that we need about 180,000 full-time employees in governmental public health right now, local and state. And we only have about 100,000. So there's an 80,000 person gap there. Uh, and uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, uh, the pandemic, the burnout, many people uh, reaching retirement age, many young people going into public health, graduates from public health school, but not going into governmental public health. So really looking at ways, not just at the federal level, but at the local and state level, we can invest in recruitment, retention, improve, and also improve hiring and promotion uh, procedures and policies. Next slide, please. The fourth uh, area focused on public health laws and governance, as, as many of you know, um, and I cited this in, in a recent Atlanta Journal-Constitution op-ed, between 2021 and the first half of 2022, state legislatures enacted 191 laws addressing public health, most of which diminished the emergency authority of public health officials or preempted local use of specific public health measures. So, reviewing, evaluating, modernizing public health governance structures at the local levels, and then clearly communicating the roles of public health departments. We clearly need better relationship and rapport between elected officials at the local level, as well as local public health officials, so they understand the importance of being proactive as opposed to just reactive, it understand the importance of getting ahead of an emergency uh, as opposed to falling behind. Next slide, please. The fifth area focuses on partnerships, the importance of public health to partner with a wide array of stakeholders, important to increase funding, as I just talked about, but, but also important to, to, to generate um, uh, really new, new coalitions. Also, the importance of, of understanding the implications for health in all government sector policy discussions. We call this health in all policies, so partnerships 
again, this is what public health does best is, is sort of the chief health strategist and the entity in a community uh, that can really build bridges. Uh, next slide, please. The final area really focused on community engagement. So there were specific action items, again, for elected officials and public health officials related to building relationships with community-based organizations, understanding the aspirations of residents. Uh, at the end of the day, as we know, uh, trust is paramount. The currency for public health uh, is really trust and, and connecting with, with uh, individuals and residents, uh, working with community-based organizations, investing in their capacity capacities continues to be so critical for public health. Next slide, please. And so what we have been discussing around the country now, now that Public Health Forward has come out, and I hope all of you ha have a chance to take a look at it, uh, is first and foremost, learn about the federal public health investments that have come to states and, and localities. Uh, since the issuing of Public Health Forward, the CDC, as you know, has put out their $4 billion public health um, infrastructure grants those dollars are flowing to 107 states and localities across the country to do many of the things that I just talked about, really to, to, to uh, ramp up um, our workforce, to support our data infrastructure, to form those partnerships. Uh, but that's one-time funding. So to ensure that we have a long-term sustainable investment in our public health infrastructure, we're going to have to make sure the stories, the impacts that come out of those grants, uh, that we're, we're going to be able, we're going to have to tell that story uh, so that we can get uh, that federal investment. But at the same time, state leadership is critical as well. There's shared responsibility here. Uh, and, and, and so federal plus state uh, leadership is going to be critical moving forward. And so once you're knowledgeable about those invest, investments, looking at these public health forward re recommendations that I mentioned, and, and I just mentioned sort of the top 12 overarching ones, but really going through them to understand well, what's most appropriate uh, for my locality, what's most appropriate for my state, uh, and trying to do that crosswalk, and then consulting with elected officials, public health officials, non-governmental organizations to implement some of the, some of those recommendations. And so that that's a little bit of a, a roadmap that I would suggest. That I hope that this is helpful to you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of, of elevating public health in your committee, uh, and and really talking to policymakers about this tremendous tremendous opportunity. I mean, we invest so little in public health, and yet the impact of public health to our livelihoods is so immense. And I think uh, taking back that definition, explaining to people what public health is really about, addressing any misconceptions will go a long way in ensuring that, that not only Georgia um, is a healthier state, but the whole country is a healthier nation. So um, those are a few introductory remarks. Um, hope that was helpful. And, and Leah, Turn it over to you and, and uh, looking forward to the question and answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Parekh, for your presentation and that power, powerful perspective on the importance of public health. So now we're gonna turn it over to the audience. Some of you submitted questions when registering. And if you have additional questions for Dr. Parekh, please type them into the Q&A function. We will try to answer as many questions as we can today related to Dr. Pyrex's presentation and expertise, but please note that some questions more specific to state and local public health in Georgia will be answered in our upcoming report. So let's go ahead and jump right in. What are some lessons learned from the pandemic about health equity and the impact of boom and bust funding cycles on advancing health equity? Yeah, well, I think in terms of health equity, the first is data, and we often did not have the data that we needed to understand uh, where we are, where we were, for example, with vaccinations, where we were with access to treatments, and and uh, I think that th th there was a big difference in terms of the first six or twelve months of the pandemic versus uh, the second and third years of, of the pandemic in in, in terms of ensuring that vulnerable populations uh, were getting vaccinated, were getting access to treatment. So the first is. It is just that racial and ethnic data that we all we always don't get from healthcare. One of the things that we need is is we need authorities uh, at the federal level for CDC to be able to, to 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 obtain that important demographic data from localities and states, uh, so they can provide that information um, to populations so that they can take the appropriate measures. In terms of our boom and bust cycle, look, I, I think we have an overall deficiency. Uh, in public health. And one of the things that we've seen, right, over the last 20 years is whenever there's an emergency, uh, we get an influx of funding, but then it goes away. 
And we know that's no way to, to, to have a sustainable infrastructure, to have a sustainable workforce. And, and so ensuring that we have long-term sustainable financing is going to be important, but that's also predicated upon demonstrating, I think, to policymakers how we're using the current resources that we have. Thank you. So you mentioned when you were speaking that there's been some recent momentum around increasing state and local funding in states like Indiana and Wisconsin. What are some lessons learned from those states? What is resonating with policymakers there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's interesting, and and um, you know, I mentioned some of them in my talk, but in particularly, I, I, you know, I think uh, in Indiana, um, you had a, a governor who had the foresight to say, let's let's. Uh, yes, we're coming out of COVID, uh, but it's really, really important to improve the health of our residents. Let's form a bipartisan commission. I think that's the first thing. So it's, it's not a it's not a political piece there. Uh, they went all around the state um, doing town halls, really um, doing a lot of research, uh, which is important, bringing stakeholders together, uh, bringing the business community, the faith based community. I think that's another thing, ensuring that public health has all of those allies um, that have the, the trust of the population, that have the trust of, of parts of the population. Um, and then they were able to present uh, really a plan uh, to the legislature. Um, and again, uh, you know, couching public health as what it is, you know, something that, that's bigger than what we just experienced in COVID. But all of these things that we take for granted, public health can do this and every citizen of that state uh, can benefit uh, from a fully funded uh, public health. And so I think those were some of the things that the state uh, uh, did. I think, again, that multi-sector partnership, uh, looking at, at public health broadly. Uh, they also, you know, opportunistically did have a surplus, uh, a budget surplus, and, and not every state is in that same position. Uh, but, but I think those are some of the things that, that I, I would look at. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's having, you know, the leadership who is open to, to something like this, depoliticizing public health, um, having the right sort of policy and political window, uh, and then having a multi-sectoral campaign. I think that that's what I'm seeing as, as successful, uh, uh, particularly in sort of purple, uh, purple red states, uh, not just blue states. Thank you so much. Um, we got a, a, another question. Are nurses part of the planning and research you've been doing? We know that nurses are the base of public health locally. Nurses are so vital. They're the base of public health locally. They're the base of healthcare locally. Uh, we, we have workforce challenges when it comes to, to nurses, just like we do with public health uh, as well as healthcare as well. So absolutely, um, through Public Health Forward, we were able to talk to a variety of, of nursing champions, nursing associations. Uh, and really, I mean, again, the workforce for public health uh, is multidisciplinary. As you know, working in health departments or knowing others who work in health departments, you know, it takes a nurse, it, it takes other clinicians, it takes uh, communication experts, it takes legal experts, uh, it takes social workers, it takes case managers, you know, it, it takes people uh, w w from a variety of different professions really to, to come together uh, and put forward the best policies and, and programs. And, and so I think we need to, as a public health community, bring everybody together uh, realizing that everybody has strengths uh, and that will only make public health stronger. So you, when we we just talked about nurses, so it seems like we're on the topic of the public health workforce. So another question we have is we know that our incredible public health workforce located in every single county here in Georgia are the foundation of a strong public health system. Are there any trends you're, we're seeing in the public health workforce across the country and what role does state and local funding play in supporting a strong public health workforce? Yeah, it's absolutely crucial. Now we are seeing a, lo a little bit more in terms of hiring of public health workers, but that's because of the $4 billion CDC public health infrastructure grant. When that goes away, again, there's another cliff unless states and localities or the federal government can, can, can make it up. And I think that is at the end of the day, the issue. Um, you know, We have thousands of public health school graduates 
every year. But why is it that so few go into local and state public health? And I think some, for some of them, it's this lack of surety that their job will be there long term. But, but frankly, you know, we need more of those graduates going into public health. We need more young people going into public health. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there, there's a certain percentage, a significant percentage of public health workers who are at the age of retirement. We've just come through COVID. It's been a lot of burnout. So this has to be really one of the top issues. And, and so how we can recruit, retain um, higher salaries, uh, looking at loan repayments, looking at scholarships, uh, making it so that graduates uh, want to go and work um, and not just in public health, but particularly in local and state and governmental public health, I think is going to be really, really uh, important. And, and again, uh, I think for policymakers, we can also couch this in the realm of, of job creation, adding to the economy, how public health contributes to the economy, um, and, and more jobs in public health, equating that to better health and, and a better economy. I think those are the types of arguments that we need uh, so that we can, we can get more sustainable resources to build a workforce in public health. So you mentioned when you were speaking, you talked about the importance of ensuring state residents and state policymakers understand what public health is and why it's important. How would you say we right the ship after the, pan the pandemic and gain regain that public trust? Yeah, Aaron, that's such an important question. and and. Yeah, you know, um, as I said, trust is really the currency for, for public health. Trust starts locally. Uh, and uh, for too many people, um, you know, they've been, uh, again, their, their um, notion, the notion of public health has is, is sort of been clouded by based, based on what they experienced during COVID. And I think it's, it's one by one individually, it's organization by organization, congregation by congregation, business by business. Policymaker, but policymaker again. It's redefining to people what public health is, and I think, frankly, before COVID, for many people, you know, they didn't really know what public health is, and then they still don't know. But but public health was working sort of anonymously, saving lives every day. People taking it for granted, and I think you know we have to reiterate that no longer can public health be taken for granted, and it can't be demonized or or people, you know, can't have misconceptions. But, but we need to, we I think as advocates and leaders need to need to be the ones to take that message. Otherwise, public health is going to be defined by others. And so, to build that trust, I think that that it's incumbent upon us to be able to communicate the value of public health, so we can rebuild uh, that trust and, and and continue to strengthen public health. And on that's that. Thank you so much for the answer because I think it leads right into the next question that we have for you. Um, talking about regaining public trust and then going a little further and getting the public to be interested enough in public health to advocate for it and to kind of build the grassroots base to advocate for public health. So is there anything you've seen in other states or ideas you have around how to get people from once they understand being interested enough to advocate on behalf of public health? And I know that's a big question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure if there are specific state examples, um, but 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 I, I would um, look to the themes of of working with different sectors um, as a way to educate people about public health. And again, business community comes to mind, faith based community comes to mind. Uh, the more allies that public health has, uh, uh, the more people can understand what what public health is all about. At the end of the day. And, and again, I, I think making this a kitchen table issue, right? So public health isn't just something abstract, but it's about the things that you talk to your family about around the kitchen table, right? So people care about safety and people care about, uh, you know, employment and schools and, and um, you know, their livelihoods, all of the things that public health on a daily basis is supporting them in, in achieving, and yet they don't recognize that actually public health has a big role in that. And, and so some of this is cultural, uh, but, but, but we can't do it alone. We need allies. And, and I think uh, understanding in, the, in localities who your allies are, who has the trust of, of the population, I think is really, really important moving forward. Great. 
So we do have, before we get to our final question, there is one more question. Um, you have shared so much with us about what other states have done, how that has looked. Is there any one activity or event that you've seen happen in another state around public health where you thought this this moved the needle? And that's that might be too detailed and that's totally fine. But were you ever, you know, at an event or heard about an event or gathering or a, a bringing together of stakeholders that you really felt like this pushed the needle, this helped us move forward that you might want to share? Yeah, it's a great question, Erin. And I, I don't know how much time you all have, but, um, um, it, you know, I think there's something really happening in, 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 in so many states across the country. Um, uh, you know, and I'm seeing in some states a little bit of the secret sauce is really getting to that governor. You know, and I'm seeing it here in 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 Maryland, where I live, Michigan, my home state, um, Indiana. So it doesn't have to be a red state or blue state. We're seeing it in, in all different states, uh, in Ohio as well. Um, so so really getting the governor, uh, key leaders in the state legislature, uh, energized. Uh, um, I, I think is really important having that. I mean, I think grassroots public health campaigns are critical. Multi-sectoral campaigning is important. So, so certainly there's a bottom-up piece, but but having that that leadership from the top and and that receptivity, I think, is really important to to um, to, to really drive change. And, and once that happens, you we have seen in states they taking an interest in costing out. Well, how much do I need for public health? All right, let, let's raise our let's increase our public health funding. Or what can we do to ensure that healthcare providers in our state um, have to report to public health for, for X, Y, and Z in terms of, of, of data sharing? Or what can we do to uh, increase salaries or improve retention and recruitment of public health, the public health workforce? So um, there are things happening from Massachusetts to Oregon to Michigan to Maryland to, again, red and blue states. And, um, you know, uh, and we can certainly follow up with, with, with specific examples. But uh, but I think there's an opportunity. And again, there wasn't as much of an opportunity in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of such a tremendous public health emergency. But but coming out of it now, uh, we're left with, uh, you know, all of those other public health emergencies that we had prior to COVID. Right. And so there's no time to waste it, you know. And uh, I think now is really the time Um to go back to those policymakers on both sides of the aisle, to go back to those sectors and say, uh, you know what, uh, this is really how you need to look at public health. Um, and, uh, and and we're here to share what, what we've learned from other states and, and hear ideas uh, to incrementally even move forward. Uh, that would be really a, a, a big achieve, achievement in states like Georgia and others. Thank you so much. Sure. As advocates, I feel like we're always happy to hear what is going on in other states. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I'll wrap up with one final question. How would we know when public health is sufficiently and sustainably funded? What will be different or what would we observe? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And, you know, you can look at, again, the leading causes of death. On the slide that, that, that I mentioned, you can look at risk factors, Poor diet is now the leading risk factor for mortality in the United States. But to what extent, as a society, have we um, improved nutrition? Uh, have we started to reduce obesity rates, continue to reduce um, uh, rates of tobacco use? Um, uh, ha have we reduced vaccine preventable illness, which we see going up? How do we get that back down? How do we improve infant mortality, maternal mortality rate. So it's really a lot of those big uh, indicators. And those indicators are going to be really hard to move unless we have that investment, again, as I said, in public health, primary care and prevention. And, and, and to some extent, those areas do have some overlap. But, but that's really where we need the attention, the focus and the investment. And if we do that, then a lot of these indicators and metrics that I just talked about, um, they will change. The, you know, people say, well, why, why haven't they changed? We're pouring so much money into, into health in this, in, in this country. Uh, we are, but, but, but it's not really going to, to the fundamental areas that can have a transformative impact to really reverse the poor health trends that we're seeing on a population base in this country. Uh, and that's why it's so f important to focus uh, on these areas like public health prevention and primary care. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Parekh, for sharing your insight with us today. Um, as a reminder to our attendees, Georgia-specific questions will be answered in our forthcoming report. If you didn't get your question answered today, please feel free to reach out to GBPI. Um, we can drop my email address and Leah's email address in the chat. So after this conversation today, we are reminded that Georgia's public health system plays such an important role in all our lives, and we all stand to benefit from building upon its strengths. So we want to take a moment to hear again from our audience and ask a similar question to what we just talked to Dr. Parekh about. So let's dream together. 10, 20 years in the future, what would a fully funded, equitable public health system in Georgia look like? So again, my colleague Hillary will be sharing the Mentimeter screen. So to share your response anonymously, you have two options. You can go to menti.com on your cell phone, your tablet or your laptop and enter 72433234, that's the code. And I'll repeat it again. You should be able to see it on your screen. That's 72433234, or you can use your cell phone to scan a QR code. So that should take you to another screen once you've entered the code where you can type your response. And so I'll give you just a moment uh, to type in some responses. All right, I'm seeing some responses rolling in. We'll just give folks about one more minute. All right, I'm seeing some things rolling in. We're dreaming together 10 to 20 years in the future. What would a fully funded, equitable public health system in Georgia look like? I'm seeing less spending on policing the judicial system and emergency room costs. It would look like an integrated public health and healthcare system for true community oriented healthcare. Access to all levels of health services and prevention measures, regardless of differences in identity or other demographic factors. Eradication of preventable diseases and stronger trust of proactive public health practices. No developmentally disabled child would be left waiting years to receive a waiver for necessary services. Public health system that can aid in improving community conditions where Georgians are born, live, and age. We've got some great answers here. Not relying on fireworks to fund trauma centers. Access to affordable and nutritious food in every community. Great answers here. Georgia mamas and babies thriving. State-of-the-art public health data systems. These are great answers. Thank you all so much for taking the time to dream with us today. So we're hoping to continue this conversation with you. Later this month, as we mentioned, GBPI will be releasing a report that takes a deeper dive on how Georgia's public health system is funded and how investing in our public health infrastructure could help us build healthier communities and a more just future for all Georgians. Everyone on this call will receive a copy of the report once it's published and a link to today's recording. We invite you to contribute to this collective push for greater attention to and investment in public health in whatever way feels comfortable for you and in whatever way you feel is the best use of your power. So you'll see on, a, on an upcoming slide three potential options for engagement. First, we encourage you to reach out to your state representative and state senator. Share with them what public health means to you and why it's important for your community. If you're a local community leader, help arrange a visit for them to your county's local health department and show off the incredible work that, of the boots on the ground in your community. Second, as you may know, the county that you live in has a county board of health. We encourage you to attend the next board meeting and learn more about the local issues your county health department is grappling with. Show your support, share your feedback, 
public health is best when shaped by people closest to the community. Lastly, we invite you to join the Health Advocates meeting run by our colleagues at Georgians for a Healthy Future. There you can hear updates around health advocacy, including updates around our state and local public health system and engage in the actions and opportunities that feel right to you. If you'd like to be added to the Health Advocates listserv and get information on upcoming meetings, please feel free to drop your information in the Q&A box and we'll make sure to get you connected. Public health is truly for all y'all. And we thank you for being in community with us today. Have a great afternoon.